Well, aren't you a regular Nancy Drew? We sure hope so, and we hope you are too. Join us as we talk Nancy Drew cover to cover and click to click. Welcome to Regular Nancy Drew. so funny playing it with somebody else and I think that it's so nice to like have someone who like doesn't have a frame of reference for what's going on really but I feel like Lance doesn't exactly fit that qualification though because he's seen me play them so many times sure it's basically like he knows he kind of knows what's going on that's why with some of like his predictions about it I was like are you predicting this or do you just vaguely remember that this happened (laughs) a little too spot on yeah 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 Uh, I was thinking we need to get April in on this and get her to play one for the first time. Oh my gosh, yes. I've never done it before, but I saw Kalina Herman posted that there is a way to play it through teams. And, like, you can give another person your, like, control of the screen. We could give her a physical copy of the game or whatever to install on whatever computer she has. And we can live stream her playing it while we commentate. (laughs) That would be fun. That would be fun. <laughs> and try to like help her and give her instructions. I'll be like, I think you're supposed to do this. <laughs> We'd have to decide which one to get her to play. Like which one would be the best to start with. Oh, so hard. I think Deception Island would be a good choice. Um, Final Scene, Treasure in the Royal Tower would be good ones. Well, the thing is, is with some of the earlier ones, is sometimes people who... I don't know about April, but, like, people who are used to playing video games and, like, newer video games and stuff, they are hard to play because they're so clunky and, like, slow. Yeah. So sometimes I recommend the later ones just just so that they understand Mm -hmm. the appeal of, like, the puzzles and stuff and without having to get bogged down in the... The clunkiness of it. Because it's like a lot of me replaying those games at this point is just nostalgia. And not like, because it's good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, not that oh, they are Oh, it's 100% nostalgia. Yeah. Not that they aren't. But just, I just don't think that people, other people would appreciate it the same way that I appreciate it. You know? So I don't know. But like, that's a hard one. Because also you don't want to go too late. Because then it's like, you, you don't get it. Expectations up too high. And you and you don't get it. Right. Like you don't get it. Like you don't get the point. You don't get the charm. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because that's that's half of the reason why they're so good. Yeah. I see all the time on the Reddit people are like, "What what should my first game be? Or what should I recommend to my friend?" And people are always like, "Sea of Darkness. It's so good." I'm like, "Yes, it's an amazing game, but you can't start there because then if you go to like you don't appreciate the rest of it. Stay tuned for danger. You're going to be like, this is crap. Look at these animations. Yeah, and you don't get the, not, like, the magic of not. it. It's so good. Stay tuned for danger. <laughs> so good. So hard to play, but so fucking good. Don't spoil yourself with the good graphics and the like. Mm, fast forward mm-hmm. through the, the boring conversations and all that. Go to, go to the classics first. Great sorry. Idea. Okay, sorry. I'm getting Great way idea. off topic here. What were we here to talk about? Oh, right. <laughs> The last train to Bloomin' Canyon. Welcome, regular Drews. Welcome. Episode number 26. (laughs) And as you can tell, we jumped straight in without even (laughs) pausing to say hello because we are so excited to talk about it. We have so much to say. It's such a good one. We started with one of the best in the series, in my opinion. I don't know where this ranks for you, but... Well, you know, I think as far as it ranks for me, it's definitely up there, but it's definitely not my favorite. But I do think that this is probably, like, collectively our favorite. Like, if we were to take all of your favorites and all of my favorites and put them together, that, like, this one is, like, both yours and my favorite. Yeah, well, yeah. I just remember talking about this with you all the time. I mean, just, like, this is the first one with Frank and Joe? Yep. Well, it's the first one where they're, like, animated in the game. We have them as phone characters previously, of course, but, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, just, I mean, just the classic nature of a mystery on a train is, like, how are you supposed to beat that? You can't. You can't beat that. You absolutely can't beat that. It's also so clever for a Nancy Drew game because it's, like, we already have kind of, like, a limited scope of where we can go that it just really makes sense to put it on, like, the limited confines of a train. And make you feel like you're still exploring all of the train. 
And it doesn't even feel confined either. Like you do have other places that you can go and explore later in the game. Like it feels like it kind of opens up more and more the more that you play it. <laughs> it's so just good. so good. Yes. So good. So what would you say are your top five then? Oh, I know. Oh, that's a okay. Hard Listen, you can't spring this on me, Corey. I don't, I don't <laughs> even know how I would begin <laughs> to start ranking them. Let me hold on. It's hard because my list of like the ones that I play the most often and ones that I think are the best mysteries aren't necessarily right. the same list, you know, cause right. like, totally. I love White Wolf of Icicle Creek, but is it the best mystery in the lineup? <laughs> Definitely <No>. not. <laughs> Do I Definitely replay it not. all the time just cause I like crunching through the snow? Yes. You know, I could probably give you a better list of my least favorite than I could give you a list of my most favorite. <laughs> least favorite. Yes. Let's have it. <laughs> no, I feel like we can't start off with that. <laughs> I'm so curious, though. <laughs> okay, my least favorite ones are definitely going to be, like, Shattered Medallion. Okay, fair. Um, Oh, probably, like, Captive Curse. Okay. Okay, this is so hard. Sorry, I'm just looking at a list, and they're all so good. They're all so good. <laughs> um, Secret of the Old Clock, Obby. I think that one gets a little boring. Uh, Haunted Carousel? Yeah. Um, and then probably... Okay, I take it back. This is just as hard. This is just as hard. I don't know that I can give you a fifth one. Midnight because, like, I Oh, oh easy so, one. Oh, yeah. Oh, obviously. I don't see I didn't even consider that because I, I don't even in my brain I don't even think about that as an easy trick. Okay. Canon, there's only thirty two games. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, thirty five if you count the dossiers and the remastered secrets. I tell. love the dossiers, oh, Corey. They're, They're very good. Uh, listen, no, I know I know exactly what you're thinking. You're like, mm, I don't count those as Nancy Drew. <laughs> They're a different series. You they right. they definitely are a different game. They are maybe a little bit younger of an audience targeted toward that. I do love the noir aspect of it. I think that that was done really well. But I have only played each of them once, to be fair. I played them a few times, like probably two or three times, handful of times. Okay, so as far as like my top favorite, I yeah, I literally don't know how I could narrow it down, but okay, probably, probably Treasure and Royal Tower yes. ranks high. Shadow Ranch, yes, of course. Blackmore Manor. <laughs> it's so hard because then when you get in the middle, all of them get so good. I know. <laughs> Warnings at Waverly Academy. Okay. Probably one of my favorites. This is the okay. This is so hard. I can't. I cannot pick. I can't pick. I have to go more than five because Sea of Darkness oh. is an amazing, an amazing game. It's a so piece good. Of art. It really is. But then also there's that also there's Ghost of Thornton Hall, oh. which is is divisive. I will give you, but a great game. I have some issues with it, but uh. And then, I mean, yeah, and then there's Last Train to Blue Canyon, too, which is so good, and I really like Alibi and Ashes. It, I, there's just, there's just too many. I know. There's too many. There's too many to pick from. I always try to think about it. I'm like, okay, we easily have a top three, <laughs> maybe four, and then the fifth one is a ten-way tie between yeah. <laughs> yeah. every exactly. other game that I like, yeah. That's exactly how it goes. So three words is obviously train, train, history, cheeseburgers, cheeseburgers. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, like yeah, lost treasure, gold, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of thing. Uh, hauntings, maybe haunting a little oh. bit. Mm, yes, mm. we'll get there. But there is a way to get no hauntings in this game. What? We'll get there. I like to do that because I, I was. Know that. You know how much of a scaredy cat I am. <laughs> I did not like the spooky bits when I was young, so I figured out how to avoid it entirely. Is it never turn <laughs> to face that one spot on the train? You don't look at the uh, the picture in the bar of Jake and Camille, um, where you click on it and then Charlena will tell you about them. If you don't ever click on it and never listen to Charlena, you never see the... Wow. Interesting. That's what triggers it. And you don't have to ever click on it and you can still finish the game. Wow. Okay. Do we want to summarize? Yeah. So yeah, the game opens with a letter Nancy is writing to Hannah 
um, explaining that she's been invited by the Hardy Boys to go on a train trip with a mystery destination organized by this heiress, <laughs> I guess, named Lori Gerard. Um, yeah, she's like this socialite um, who has a, just a, you know, rich dad <laughs> who has purchased the train for her. And then we kind of shoot to a cut scene where Nancy and a bunch of other characters are in a dining room at this train's dining car, all seated around this table. And Lori is giving a speech, talking about why she's invited them and introducing everyone. So we meet John Gray, who's also been invited on this train. He is a paranormal investigator with his own TV show called Ghost Chasers. Charlena Purcell... A romance novelist um, who was, yes, also a phone character in Secret of Shadow Ranch, if you played that. Tino Balducci, who is a police detective. (laughs) And a major asshole. Um, But he is famous because he just, like, cracked this national robbery case or something and apprehended suspects in a very... I guess, newsworthy way. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And then, of course, also the Hardy Boys, who I think Lori introduces them as Harvey Boys. Um, (laughs) And she also misnames Nancy, calling her Natalie and a bunch of different things. Just saying that, like, oh, my dad's friends with their dad, so they're invited and they brought their friend Natalie. (laughs) During this cutscene, the camera kind of just pans around and shows everyone seated around the dining car in the train. And Laurie starts explaining that this train was originally owned by a miner named Jake Hurley. She says that one day in 1903, the train was found abandoned near Blue Moon Canyon in Colorado with no one on board except the dead engineer. Um, Jake was never found and the train was just put into storage until Laurie's dad bought it recently for her and had it fixed up and restored to working order. Um, and she tells them that they are going to go to Copper Gorge, Colorado, which is the last town or last town where Jake was seen, also the closest town to where Blue Moon Canyon is. Um, and they're going to investigate what happened to him. Laurie also says that there was a rumor that shortly before his death, Jake had discovered a massive gold mine somewhere in Colorado, so we don't know exactly where. But supposedly this train is haunted because Jake's wife, Camille, died on the train on their way to the gold mines. Uh, But then while she's explaining this, the lights suddenly cut out, Lori screams, and then when the lights come back on, Lori is gone. Oh my gosh. (laughs) So much to process. We have, obviously, haunted train, potential gold mine. Now we have missing person, but then also we have, you know, romance novelist, we have famous detective, we have paranormal investigator, we have the Hardy Boys. So it's like, it's just so much, so quickly. It's like all-star cast coming together to solve this mystery. Hell yeah. Right after she disappears, kind of everybody is still sitting there, they're like, you know, what what happened? But then John Gray is like, basically, obviously she was kidnapped by the ghost. He's a paranormal investigator, so I guess he has to say that. That has to be his role. (laughs) And he's like, y'all should know better. Tino's like, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. And Charlena is like, obviously, she just did this for attention. Excuse me. I'm going to go write my book. (laughs) So they all kind of disperse either to investigate or to ignore what is happening. And then we kind of get free reign to start exploring the train. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so immediately we're still in the dining car, so we can kind of look around the dining car. There are some things that we find. We find, like, an old doll. We find a painting of an eagle. It's, like, locked, but you can tell something's behind it. If you look really closely, you can see there's a gemstone in the chandelier. And then in the dining car, we also have Frank and Joe and Charlena. They are our two installments. Or I guess three, if you count Frank and Joe as being two. Right. Who are permanently in the dining car. If you're not familiar with Nancy Drew Games, if maybe you're listening to our podcast just because you're a fan of the books, kind of the way it works is you have a bunch of characters and they don't really move around that much. So they're kind of always where (laughs) where they always are. Unless they're not. And then you can snoop through their things. And then you can snoop through (laughs) their things. But um, if you need to talk to them, it's usually always going to be in the same location. So you can talk to Charlena, 
and she basically just starts talking smack about Lori and about how she's doing this for attention. Um, we also, when we're talking to Charlena, we get interrupted by Joe, who kind of whispers to Nancy like, hey Nancy, come over here. And so they tell us that as everybody kind of dispersed, they followed Tino um, and John. Well, Joe followed Tino and Frank followed John. Um, John went to Camille's room and <laughs> Joe, or, uh, Frank says that he heard weird noises, but he never came out of there. Um, and then Joe also saw Tino pick something up off of the floor of the dining car and... Joe kind of asks him about it, but Tino brushes him off and doesn't give him any details about what it was or what he picked up. Also, while talking to the Hardy Boys, we learn that they are members of ATAC, American Teens Against Crime, which is not really discussed, but we're supposed to understand that this is basically like a spy agency for teenagers? For children? I want to say this is from the books. I think it must be. It must be. I don't know. I've never read the Hardy Boys books. But I need to know more. <laughs> I need to know about Frank and Joe being secret agent teenagers. It's because it's like Joe is like super proud of it. He's like, please let me tell him about the work that we do for ATAC. And Frank is like, no, you know that's classified. <laughs> I'm like, What? Excuse me, what's classified? If only we could go back to this, the, like, peak her interactive years and convince them to start making a Hardy Boys game line as well so we could oh, explore that a little bit further. Ooh, be If so only, good. I know. Oh, it would be so good. Um, but so Frank and Joe also kind of give their opinion of what's going on. Joe kind of thinks that there is some credence to maybe, hey, maybe the train is haunted. Maybe she was kidnapped by a ghost. We don't know. Uh, but Frank tends to think that Lori is faking it. So, yes. Okay, at this point, we kind of have a little bit more free reign to explore the train a little bit. So as we've been saying, we are in the dining car currently where we have the dining table where Frank and Joe are. And then Charlene is also there. We do also have like a small room off the dining car where you can use the phone to call the conductor. He won't really tell us anything. He's not too concerned that Lori is missing. And he says, you know, I take orders for Miss Gerard. So unless you're her, I don't want to hear from you, basically. I don't care if she fell off the train. We're going to keep going to our destination. <laughs> Just harsh. Jeez. <laughs> yeah. There is also like a steam valve system in that same room with the phone. And that's going to come up to be relevant later. But we can't really use that yet. Then if you go into the next car, I think that's the sleeping car. So not too much to do in there. We don't actually see any of the sleeping quarters. We can just kind of walk through it. And then there's a puzzle or a couple puzzles in that car. Um, and then you go on to the next one. I think that that is Camille's private car where she has her room set up with her dolls and her piano and some games and stuff. And that is where John Gray has kind of set up his headquarters with all of his ghost hunting equipment going in there, beeping all the time, trying to pick up whatever signals he can. After that, I think, is Jake's private car where he has, like, his office area and Tina's set up shop in there. And then at the very end of that car, there's, like, this scale system where there's a locked door and we have to somehow use this scale to unlock the door. And then we can talk to Tino and John at this point to, to get kind of their opinion on what's going on with Lori and what they heard. Yeah. So, I mean, we don't learn too much from John Gray. He just talks about how he kind of explains what he's doing with all his different readings and ghost hunting equipment and stuff. Um, and we kind of can ask each of the characters what they think about each other. And we learn pretty much that nobody on this train likes each other. Yep. <laughs> John Gray thinks Tino is, like, pitiable because... He's not really that great of a cop, um, and he thinks that Charlena is a hack, um, <laughs> who, he said, okay, I just have to say, because it's irritated so much, he says, Charlena Purcell writes romance novels, end of comment. What's Excuse wrong with me? that? What the hell, dude? Yeah, what's wrong with writing romance novels? Sorry, I am a romance novel fan, um, and so it just, it's, it stings when people look down on them. There is nothing Perfectly wrong with acceptable. romance novels. Especially if they have a historical aspect to it, which I love, which hers do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So, John Gray is on my shit list um, <laughs> for that. I will say, though, it's super fun talking shit about all <laughs> the other people on the 
train with everybody. I think that might be like one of my favorite aspects of this game is just the fact that nobody likes each other and you can <laughs> go to somebody else and be like, so what do you think of, what do you think of John Gray? What do you think of this person? What do you think of Lori? And everybody's just like, they're so, I can't believe, they're so stupid. I hate them. Oh. <laughs> it's so funny. But so in Camille's car where John Gray is, if you explore, you do find a metal puck with a number seven on it. A little, it, it, it's a slug. It's a slug, but not like a slug, like an, like an insect slug. Are slugs insects? Sure. I don't Not know. Not like the creature, the slug, but like a metal... Round disc. Round disc. It's a slug. I think we only know that it's a slug because Nancy maybe says so at one point. I think we get one from Tino and she's like, oh, this slug, thanks. Yes, yes. Yeah, so when we talk to Tino, he gives us another one that has a number three on it. Which that's what Lori dropped, right? Yes, that's what he found on the floor of the train car. And he says, eh, you can have it. It's useless. Uh, I'm sure it doesn't mean anything. It's just trash. Here, If you think you can do something with it, kiddo, go ahead. Um, we're like, okay, cool. Thanks. Um, so there's some other stuff. When we're talking to Tino, there's some other stuff in Jake's car too. We find some like... Uh, a gemstone identification book. There's like a periodic table on the wall. There's also some more creepy doll references. There's like a picture of Camille with two dolls like she posed with them. So in that train or in that car as well. Uh, yeah, you talked about the scales set of like scales built into the wall. We now have like these two metal slugs and if you go approach the the scale, automatically those slugs get moved from your inventory onto those uh, onto that table. Mm -hmm. So you're like, okay, well now I know what to do with the metal slugs. <laughs> <laughs> um, and every time whenever I play this game, every time I never look up like any information on how to complete this very first step of this. I just always mess around with the slugs on the scales because there's only two to start with and it's not that hard. Um, and so then once you figure out how to unlock that door, you get into this room that is like, are we still on a train? <laughs> it's like the mechanical room, but not quite. Yeah. Lance, when he was playing this with me, because I played this with my husband, he said this was like out of mist. <laughs> this this kind of mechanical situation. It's like, I don't even really know how to describe it. We don't know what it does yet, obviously. But there's like this weird five-armed like thing that Octopus rotates. Octopus almost. <laughs> yeah, but has like, you can open up the little containers on them. And they also have like. A spot shaped, where something should go, right? basically. Right denoted by like an animal shape there's like a beak there's like an octopus tentacle arm there's like a fish fin there's a horse hook all those kinds of things starfish and, yep right and then there's also like a lever and there's like a place to put a couple other things and then there's like this big wide table there's also some like cabinets and stuff in there then you can kind of look through them you can find a couple things you find the blueprints of supposedly how this works, and we, we see that there is a spot to put a lamp, like an oil lamp kind of thing. It's mm -hmm. actually a carbide lamp, but we'll get to that. Yep. <laughs> and, um, and like a, a telescope, and that when you put those in and basically turn it on, it's supposed to like project something. So it's basically a fancy projector. And then we also find some some puzzle information and we do find this little eight letter combination lock and we find like a nine tile puzzle on the back door these puzzles are like the easiest puzzles in the world and while i enjoy them kind of i'm like this is i feel like it's not enough to be qualified as being a puzzle because it's just not that hard and it's just trial and error. All you have to do is like depress them, press the buttons until they're all depressed. I really like that kind of puzzle. It's simple, yeah. but it's done in like 10 seconds. But it's like, you can't use this as a lock to another door because like, it's not really locked. It's right. just really like a very complicated handle. Yeah. <laughs> 
But anyway, once you solve that, you can then get into the next car. Which is where Lori is hiding out. Takes us approximately 10 minutes to find her. You think it's going to be like <laughs> the majority of the game, but... You think that's the whole mystery, but it's not. Nope. You find her in like literally 10 minutes of play. Safe and sound, just chilling on the couch in the back car. I, I don't even really know what this car is. I kind of think of it as Camille's car, but I think it's more of like an entertainment car because there's the big couch, there's a dance floor, and there's like a music, what is it called? A phonogram is the only thing that's coming to mind, phonograph? but that's phonograph. There we go. I know, I know phonogram is not a real thing. I don't know why I came <laughs> up with that. Uh, but then there is also this large like hutch uh, but yeah, Lori is there. She's safe and sound, and she's very surprised to find that Nancy is the one that found her. Uh, but obviously, Nancy found her. So we learn that there is a little button in the floor of the dining car that Lori used to, like, you step on the button, and then a bookcase slides out of the way, and then she was able to sneak out of the room just like that, which, why not just use the we, doorway? Because we it's have right to there. talk about this. <laughs> we have to talk about this. Okay, I'm sorry, we have to stop pause for just a minute because what we're supposed to believe has happened um (laughs) is that in the moment where everything went dark Lori went through this secret passageway into where the bar the bar right that's what i would think too because when you look at the train car it's like you see the bookcase in the in the dining room and What's directly behind that on, like, the other side of the wall in the same car is, like, this little bar area, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but also, like you said, there's also the door is right there on that same It's right next to each other, the secret passageway and then just the normal doorway. And also, so after that, regardless, she has to leave that train car to go into the next train car to go into the next train car to go into the next train car, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Supposedly... She dropped this slug while she was doing that because Mm -hmm. Tino had to pick it up off the floor. But I think she did that on purpose. Oh, you think? I think she did that because she knew that we needed that to get back there. But she wanted to keep that door locked to, I guess, like test whoever was going to get there. How did she get back there? Because the door was locked to go up there. She have another one, maybe? Maybe she pre-unlocked it and then locked it behind herself when she went through. Great. Okay, so, yeah. That could work. That could be the explanation. But also, we're supposed to believe the fact that she went through this door uh, to the other side of the train car, which she she could have just gone through the door, not the secret passageway. <laughs> but then that nobody was like, hey, maybe she ducked into this other room. Let's take a look. Because, like, immediately they all get up and look mm-hmm. to see where she went. And it's like she would have still had to go through the same way to get out. And so did nobody go or she was just faster, but nobody heard the train car open? I just, it's you very You heard tenuous. the door. Yeah, if yeah. you can hear the scream, you can hear the door. Right? And so obviously, if you heard her scream and then hear the, the train door open, which by the way, this is a moving train. So even if you don't hear the door open, you're going to hear the outside of the train suddenly get louder once the door is open. Right. And then hear the as it shuts or whatever. So you're going to be like, well, somebody went through the door. Mm-hmm. Did somebody take Lori? Like, we should we should go after them. Yeah, what's the thing she didn't just jump off? Right. Nobody, so nobody hears her. I think I maybe just... we're just on a train with bad detectives. <laughs> I feel like when when I was a child, I used to imagine that it wasn't that Lori went through this wall into the other tra- that part of the train car. It's that she went into some kind of secret passageway scenario, which took her directly to the back of the train. Mm-hmm. But that ca- absolutely that, cannot be it. Right. <laughs> because that doesn't make any sense. Because these are all separate train cars. And they are the only point of connection is, is obviously the bolt that keeps them together and maybe some wires to cross. Like, there is no, you, there would be no way for a secret passageway to connect all the way from, like, the front of the train in one train car to the back of the train in another train car, right? Unless she went on the roof. No way. <laughs> no. No way. That didn't happen. Yeah. So I just find that it's a very, very tenuous disappearing act situation. Anyway, kind of unnecessarily sorry. elaborate. <laughs> Continue. 
Uh, so um, we're talking to Lori, and she says that she found this letter in the garbage when she first uh, like like got this trade from her dad and kept it for whoever the winner was, whoever found her after she went missing. That was kind of her little test to see who was going to be the best detective. So Jake wrote this letter to his niece in 1901 because he was paranoid about people coming forward to try to claim his treasure or whatever. Um, And he was just worried that something was going to happen to him or no one would ever find out where his treasure was. So he wrote this letter to his only living relative. Uh, Her name is Ruth Kensington, by the way. And he says that everything that she needs in order to find the treasure is on this train and in this letter. So... Lori thinks that Ruth never figured out where this treasure was, and therefore the treasure is still out there to be found, because why else would it have just been in the garbage in the in the train all this time? Uh, so Lori says, you know, Nancy, here's your letter, here's your prize, take it and go use it to do whatever you need to do to find the treasure. Nancy asks Lori, why haven't you looked for the treasure yourself? And Lori is like, oh, why not let other people do it so that I could just kind of hang out and y'all can, can sol- solve it or whatever. Um, but then she's also really creepy about Tino. Somehow he comes up and she's very obviously got a crush on him. You could just tell his mind's in there going 90 miles an hour. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> That's what she says. Sorry, it's the funniest line. It's the funniest line. It is, it is. It's wonderful. Uh, But then we read the letter, it's kind of cryptic. It mentions a few different towns that they visited. Um, It's very cryptic, yeah. It it basically gives a list of instructions as to how to locate the mine. Um, But none of the instructions really make sense, obviously yet, until we figure out what all the things are referring to. Mm -hmm. There's a few other things that we can look at in this car. So there's the dance floor. There are a pair of like dancing shoes hung up, like ballroom shoes, I guess, hung up by the dance floor. And there is also a puzzle that's got weird, it looks like a word search almost. And then there's a wrench that we find that we'll use later to open up one of the vents. Um, Because there's a vent that needs to be opened, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's in the sleeping car. Or no, Camille's car. Yes. So at this point, we're like, well... We found Lori, so let's go spread the news. So we go to talk to Tino, because he's kind of the first on our way back. And he, you know, we're like, hey, so we found Lori. Turns out that slug you gave us wasn't so useless after all. And he's like, oh, well, I, you know, I knew that. I knew it was an important clue. But, like, I wanted to give it to you as, like, an opportunity for you to get some experience, get your feet wet, you know, do some problem solving or whatever. Um, We're like, hmm, okay, patronizing dickhead. And we also kind of asked him about Lori, too, because of what the Lori kind of made some comments to him or comments about him earlier. So we're kind of, like, trying to, like, suss out what their relationship is. Um, and he says, oh, yeah, you know, we, we had met in New York at a party or something. But he says, there's not a lot upstairs. Oh, my God. He's so judgy. What an ass. He's such an asshole. <laughs> I'm mm-hmm. sorry. Tino is the worst. The worst. Um, but so he kind of puts Lori down, calls her dumb. And he says, oh, no, you know, we never went out. Mm, whatever. But he says that very suspiciously, so it's like, okay, well, it sounds like you did go out, but you're just embarrassed to say that you did. We need to talk about this later, too. This is, um, I have, I have a big issue <laughs> with this. Anyway, also, we talked to him because when you, <laughs> there's like a cougar statue next to him on this desk. Sorry, this is like really random. There's a cougar statue next to him on the desk that has, like, a gemstone in the side of it. And we're like, oh, hey, Tino, you know, can we see that? And so we go to pick it up, kind of turn it around to examine it. We learn it's a cigar clipper, by the way, um, but it just is a massive one for some reason. <laughs> but we can't get the gem out of the side of it without Tino being suspicious. At this point, I don't really understand why we can't do that or like why it matters if tito is suspicious like you know we're just trying to solve this we're just trying to find this treasure now so it's not like like what's i just don't understand what the issue is but whatever we can't get that yet but i just have to say that in this moment where you pick up this object and this happens in a lot of nancy drew games where you pick up an object but the object just kind of floats (laughs) 
this is the first time. Because we're not supposed to see Nancy, so they don't right. want to animate her hands. I understand not wanting to animate something unnecessarily. But, like, her hands, like, we're not even allowed to see Nancy's hands. Nope. Too revealing, sorry. Too revealing, I guess, about <laughs> who she is. Um, and I, but this is, like, the first time that I had ever thought of this as, like, being an issue is when I was sitting here playing with someone else and being like, yeah, it is kind of weird that we don't, that it doesn't, it looks like just this weird floating object in midair. I've never thought of that. <laughs> like, it's very bizarre, especially this one, it just looked really weird the way that it, that they did it. Like, like it was being physically manipulated in the air, and there's a point where, like, um, Nancy, quote-unquote Nancy, moves the tail so that the clipping mechanism because it's a cigar clipper like works but obviously she's not actually manipulating this object it's just being moving in midair <laughs> so you just see this thing just kind of raise into the air float turn around you see the tail twitch a couple times and the mouth chop a couple times so it just looks like this haunted object just yeah. rising up <laughs> moving on its own that's camille so that's our first evidence of a haunted ghost right <laughs> Also at this point, um, we can open one of the puzzles in Jake's car because in the mechanism room back in the back, we find kind of the instructions for how to open this locked box in Jake's car. And inside this locked box, we find a receipt for lamps sent from Thomas Wilson. And this is where we find the instructions on how to work this specific lamp that's supposed to fit into that projector thing in the back. Um, we also find a dance pattern, um, like written out on a little piece of paper called Hurley's Whirly Burly. <laughs> um, and presumably we're supposed to use this somehow with the dance floor back in um, Lori's hiding place back there. Mm -hmm. Next, we go on to Camille's car where John Gray is. We are able to use that special wrench to open up the vent in the wall. And there are some pipes behind there. So we have to kind of rearrange all the pipes so that they connect to make one, I guess, seamless line for the steam to travel through. Because again, there is that steam Classic. pipe at the, the front of the oh. train. Okay, hang on. We got to talk about this really quickly too yes. because I realized we skipped over that. So yeah, in the dining car, the, there's like this wheel turny mm -hmm. thing and all these pipes right and it says there's like a warning sign on it which is like i don't I, caution if pressure gets too much or something but when you go to turn that wheel and the pipes aren't connected the pressure increases to the red mm -hmm. if the pipes aren't connected shouldn't the pressure go down shouldn't steam pressure built up in this the like the wherever the steam originates oh. from possibly because there's no like outlet for that to go through uh, okay maybe okay. Mm, that doesn't make sense to me though because if if the pipes are just sitting there disconnected and all we have to do is connect the pipes to get that to work mm -hmm. then the steam would just go through the whatever it leads to get to the first set of pipes and then just dissipate mm -hmm. so what is why is the pressure going high instead of low shouldn't it be that the pressure goes low and then nancy can make some comment like hmm, seems like it's not holding pressure i think it's a just an excuse to blow us up it's a good second <laughs> chance option because if you do turn it on the train will blow up because there's too much steam and so you have to try over but try again <laughs> but <laughs> anyway sorry sorry yes so yeah you solve the yeah the so you pipes puzzle which I love those puzzles. They're so simple, it's but classic. They're, they're a good one. It's a classic Nancy Drew kind of puzzle too. And there's a few of them and they get harder as you do them, which is just another nice bit about it. But um, we also talked to John Gray, let him know that Lori's okay. And he's like, oh, you know, I have been having some, some bad vibes that there's danger afoot on this train. Maybe it wasn't about Lori. Maybe it's about you. <laughs> spooky, spooky. spooky. <laughs> Uh, but whatever, that's fine. We go and tell Charlena as well. She insults us. She calls the Hardy Boys Boy Scouts. Yeah, she gives us. She gives the Hardy Boys a backhand. A compliment is like, you know, you Boy Scouts would be better detectives than Tino. Well, that's not Aww. wrong, but also it's phrased so rudely. Well, and like just like it's a <laughs> it's a diss at Tino, and it's like, whoa, lady, whoa. <laughs> I'm okay with dissing Tino. He is the worst. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not the Hardy Boys, though. Don't come for them. 
Uh, but then we do go to talk to the Hardy Boys and we share the letter with them. We tell them about the mechanical train car that we found and that we need to find the lamp and pickaxe that are supposedly been left with someone named Buell. And they're like, oh, that's so funny because we actually found this old photo, which, side note, I think is just a like a screen grab from Shadow Ranch of Dry Creek <gasps> Ranch because it's it's like the same building that they've just put Buells on. You can even see like the rock formations in the background. I did not notice that. That's amazing. But yeah, so they show us this photo of like, oh, we found this old photo of this place in Copper Gorge called Buell's. So we know that there's a store there called Buell's. And so we're like, oh, maybe the pickaxe and the lamp that we're looking for are still with whoever owns that store, right? Um, And so Nancy also asked the Hardy Boys to see if they can track down the name of the engineer who was found dead on board when the train was originally found back in the early 1900s because we haven't, we found references to the fact that there was an engineer, but we've never been able to find out what his name is so far. So we give that task to the Hardy Boys, look into that, um, and now we decide that we are going to go back to the caboose. Or no, we're going to go talk to somebody else, but as we're walking through the train, the train just stops all of a sudden, kind of throws Nancy backwards, and we find out that the emergency brake has been thrown. Yeah, we are kind of like put back into the dining car and talking to the Hardy Boys. The Hardy Boys say that they were the first persons on the scene after the e-brake was pulled, but they didn't see anybody there. Um, Which how? Because Nancy left before them, but whatever. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe, Corey, maybe she fell onto the floor and was knocked unconscious. <laughs> That's another wonderful second chance scene as well, though. If you throw the emergency brake when you shouldn't, Nancy will hit her head really hard and fall on the ground. <laughs> it's really funny. Sorry, I forgot. <laughs> You're good. Um, so we're talking to the Hardy Boys, and they tell us also that they were there, but then eventually everybody showed up to come, you know, kind of see what has happened or whatever, except for Charlena. Um, she never, she never came. Presumably she was just too busy working on her novel, or was she the one who actually pulled the e-brake? We'll (laughs) never know. Uh, no, we will, we will find that out eventually. But we also learned that the engineer was, like, super upset that somebody did this, because there's, like, a big sign, like, basically don't pull the e-brake unless it's an emergency (laughs) yeah um and so he basically gets everybody to clear out joe thinks that a ghost pulled the emergency brake of course he (laughs) does that's our joe (laughs) i love joe so much um but yeah then we go to talk to to people about it and when we talk to tino we see that there are some packing peanuts on the floor of you know this room where he is and oh, we talked to Tino, and he tells us that he found fingerprints on the emergency brake, but he said because the engineer touched it before he could do his investigating or whatever, he doubts that it's going to come to anything. Uh, but he does tell us, yeah, that he found a small thermometer, and so he thinks, like, hmm, looks like it might be John Gray. You know, I know that his show's on the verge of getting canceled, so... Mm, I bet he's just trying to drum up some exciting content for his show. Um, We also talk to him about, uh, we show him the letter that Lori gave to us. And he is super salty about it. um, That like, why wouldn't Lori just give this to me? But we're like, well, you know, you can look at it if you want. I don't mind, right? And so we show it to him. And he's just like, uh, you said you found this in the trash. Obviously, this is useless. This is just, you know, garbage. It's. You can't, mm-hmm. it, it just gobbledygook, right? It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> We're like, okay, Tino, you know, yeah, the le- the last letter that Jake Hurley wrote to one of his descendants trying to explain how to get the gold. Of course, it will be useless in our trying to find this this treasure. <laughs> Good call to, to cash it aside so quickly, right? <laughs> Um, but so since Tino, um, you know, showed us the thermometer and everything, we go to talk to John Gray. We ask, you know, hey, are you missing a thermometer? And he says, yeah, I couldn't find it um, in the box that I packed it in, but I definitely didn't pull the emergency brake, so I don't know what that's about. And he says, yeah, my show was canceled last night, but it's actually picked up by a bigger network, so it wasn't an issue. Like, it's just, it's fine. So he's unconcerned. Um, and then, but he does show us some ghostly evidence he found. He um, shows us this Polaroid of basically like this like light blur picture um and he says that this this phantom light is camille mm-hmm. which is like mm, what else would yeah. it be okay 
<laughs> Nancy's even like, are you sure it's that and not, uh, you know, just like a Damaged problem paper. with the film yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that you use? And he's like, oh, no, no, definitely could be. <laughs> so part of kind of after we've, you know, done this, part of what the letter that Jake Hurley left to his niece says that we need to know the name of Camille's favorite dancing shoes. So we're like, hey, you know, they're dancing shoes in the back of the train. So we go back there and look in them, but the ink or whatever the label on it is completely faded with age. And so you have to call Bess and George (laughs) Um, to have them help us out with that. I don't really understand why. It's best that George have to help us with this research. Um, I feel like we typically would go to the Hardy Boys since they're just sitting up there in the, you know, dining car. But I guess it's just an opportunity for us to call best George. I think so. I think they're also supposed to be our historical fashion experts, aren't they? From uh, oh. Shadow Ranch. Right. Sorry, I forgot. <laughs> Um, but so we take a picture of the shoes and send that to them. But also since we're back here, um, and we have the, um, you know, the little piece of paper from Jake's car for Hurley, or Hurley's Hurley's Whirly Whirly. Whirly. (laughs) Yes. We can go ahead and perform that on the, uh, on the dance floor. (laughs) Which, does it say to do that in the letter? I think it probably says to do that in the letter. I think so, Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we know we have to, to do that as well. So we go ahead and do that. And when we do that, the cabinet, the locked cabinet that's also in that car, opens. A gem falls out, so we can pick that up. And also, and then when we open it, <laughs> we see rows and rows of creepy-ass dolls. <laughs> the creepiest porcelain dolls. <laughs> we have to talk about Camille's age later. Mm. mm. We have to talk about Camille later, but yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we we have this row of dolls that are creepy and half of them are broken or their eyes are bulging out of their heads staring <laughs> at us. Yeah, I mean, at this point, it's like we can't, we can't quite solve this puzzle yet. Right. Um, but it's kind of clear that we're supposed to put these dolls into some kind of order um, because you can pick them up and move them around. But also on this cabinet there's like a locked drawer um and so presumably solving putting these dolls in the correct order will unlock that drawer yes so. you can pretty much immediately call Bess and george back and they will give you <laughs> the name of these shoes um which is uh chaussettes chateauillants there you go i'm sorry for my bad french i'm so sorry because i know that was awful but it means shimmering socks That's the name of the shoe brand. And the initials of the dolls, all the references to the dolls that we've seen spread about the train so far, kind of give us an idea of what that doll's name was. And so we take the initials of each doll and then we set it up in the order of Chaussette Chateauillance and it spells out the word when you have the dolls in the right order. Um, And then that does, like you said, it opens that locked drawer in the cabinet. Um, yeah, the, the, all the dolls have different names. Like, there's some really great ones. Chantilly Hildegard, mm-hmm. Hagar, Anderson, um, Awful Ursula. Yes. <laughs> really creepy name. <laughs> oh my goodness, yes. In that drawer, I think all we really find is some more slugs, different numbers on them, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, more, more slugs. And we get to talk to Lori. Um, We get a little bit more hints at her having a crush on Tino. We kind of fake her out like, oh, you know, Tino told me everything. So what what really happened between you guys? And she ends up telling us most of it, that they both really liked each other. They did actually go out a few times, but then he just stopped calling. So that prompts us to go get the other side of the story from Tino, who we also kind of fake out and convince him to give us more of the story. Apparently his friends or colleagues, whoever kind of judged him for dating her because she was, you know, she's this Paris Hilton parody, basically. She's in the news all the time, not a lot of great press about her. And he was concerned that if people didn't take her seriously, then he, they wouldn't take him seriously, which that shouldn't be most of your concerns right now, you know, right? (laughs) Such an ass. I know. He's horrible. He's awful. Uh, But yeah, so he admits that when he realized that he just stopped calling. So 
that into things between Tino and Lori, but then he's like, you know what, if I really do care, maybe I should go talk to her again. So that prompts a weird romance <clears throat> plot line. <clears throat> also, when we asked Lori about the emergency break being thrown, she says that it's Camille who threw it, and she's Camille, the ghost, stopped the train, and that's what happened. Um, but then that word search thing that's in the same train car is where Laura is sitting. We can put in all the names of the towns that were mentioned in the letter to Ruth, and it gives us a random string of eight letters. Where have we seen a place where we might need eight random letters before? In the mist car, the mechanical <laughs> weird room. <laughs> yeah, so we we can go in there and enter that string of letters, and then this contraption thing comes to life, whirs to life, and this arm zooms out and across and there are all these bunch of little tiny cubby holes like up at the top of the car um and this arm goes and like pokes into one pulls out a map and then unrolls the map on this like big table thing mm-hmm. okay oh. big map, <laughs> that's what that does where we just the map. we can look at the map but the map really doesn't it doesn't even have any like landmarks on it or any town names or anything it really just looks like this topographical map and so we're just kind of like mystified as to what it means right mm-hmm. but that's as that's as far as as we can move with that so far also oh yeah can we can we talk about how like why in the heck are all of these maps in cubby holes so high and why do we have to have a mechanical arm that comes out to pull out the map would it not just be that like jake had a bunch of maps and they had a label and that maybe solving the puzzle could get tell us to which map to pick based on like a labeled map instead of having to enter it into a machine that like had a fancy mechanical arm that whizzed out and pulled out a specific map it just seems like why is this technology (laughs) invented who invented this technology? Jake invented it. It's late 1800s luxury. You can't flush a toilet, but you can get a magical arm to pull a map out for you. You know. So he must have been some kind of serious genius. Unsung genius to be able to do this. I mean, he is pretty remarkable, as we'll learn later. But <laughs> but it's just, like, so unnecessary. Like, the most unnecessary mechanization that I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Good animation, though. Props to, what was it, 2005? Yeah, 2005. Arguably some of the best animation I've ever seen in a Nancy Drew game. Um, If you go to John's, or if you go to where John is in Camille's car, um, at certain points you can listen to more ghostly evidence. He has a recording, and if you listen really hard, he you can hear, like, a woman singing. Um, and he says that's Camille. That is never explained, I don't think. But it's also kind of implied that, like, it really could be anything making that noise. They don't right. really know. It could be somebody humming in the next room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there are other people on this train. <laughs> <laughs> um, so eventually at some point, after asking Frank and Joe, Frank and Joe were unsuccessful in finding the name of the engineer, um, so we have to ask Charlena because Charlena is like a history researcher too. That's like all she does for her novel. She's like this massively impressive researcher. Mm-hmm. Um, and so eventually we ask her. She doesn't give two figs about any hidden gold mine that Jake Curley has. Um, but she did find the name of the engineer for you. Oh, we don't, we don't find that until later. She doesn't tell us. She doesn't? We find out. It's in the stove. Oh, you're right. You're right. She couldn't. She she couldn't find Screw a record. You, Charlena, we're a better researcher yeah. than you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So she couldn't. She couldn't find it. Um, and then we go to talk to Frank and Joe, and Frank and Joe tell us that we just missed a massive argument between Charlena and Lori. Charlena basically. You know, I, we, we don't know what it's about. And then Frank and Joe don't really tell us, I don't think. But if you go immediately talk to Charlena again, she just says, oh, you know, we were just discussing a topic on which, uh, you know, we were both very passionate. So it wasn't an argument. We were just passionate about it. But if you say like, oh, OK, well, I was hoping to get your side of the story. But I guess since you won't tell me, I'm just going to have to go ask Lori what it was about. Um, that's really too bad. Um, and Charlena's like, oh, okay, well, I'll tell you. 
<laughs> it's just that she had previously approached me with some ideas of a romance novel and I responded to her. But then one of those ideas that Lori had sent in to Charlena somehow ended up in one of Charlena's recent books mm. without any kind of credit or payment to Lori. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. Gross. What a sticky bitch. A I know. Sticky bitch. <laughs> Awful behavior. So yeah, Charlena stole an idea from Lori and didn't credit her. Unreal. Charlena was calling Lori dumb earlier, and but yeah. now she's not too dumb to write a book or write come up with book ideas. And so what Charlena's excuse for this is that she says legally Lori can't prove anything. And also Lori already has enough money. She doesn't need any more money. It's not about the money. I think Can it's you about... believe? Yeah. How awful. About the fact that you plagiarized Charlena. I'm sorry. That's not okay. Not okay. Not Can't okay. justify that away at all. Yeah, you can also at this point go to talk to Tino and basically after having seen some packing peanuts on the floor of his crate, we realize that he must have stolen the thermometer from John and framed him for pulling the e-brake. So we ask him about that and say, hey, so it was you who threw the e-brake. And he basically admits to it. Um, he says he got carried away because he wanted to get positive press for solving, right, the mystery of who pulled the e-brake. Mm-hmm. All, all of these people Skeezy. are awful. All of these people are awful. Every single one of them. <laughs> Um, At this point, we are able to open up the dining car because we have some additional slugs from that drawer in the the locked cabinet. But that, uh, I don't know if we said it before, but there's a stove in the dining car that's locked and it's got symbols on it, meaning you can only open it with that scale, slug slug scale, whatever it's called. Um, But then we open that, we find a piece of paper in there basically saying, I agree to pay these wages to be my conductor to... James Thurston. So we find out that that must have been the name of the engineer that Jake hired. Um, And so Nancy goes back to the Hardy Boys and assigns that task to him. You know, can you look into James Thurston a little bit more? See if we can find any information about him. Then we are going back through, walking through the train and we like turn at one point and we can see out the window. And this is when we do get a little bit of a haunting. We see, I see you call them ghost bubbles, which is the perfect description. Literally, I was I was sitting here letting Lance play while I was taking notes for a lot of this. And he, uh, when he turned to see that, he just, this is the exact phrase he says, Oh my gosh, I just saw a ghost! Ghost bubbles! <laughs> <laughs> Which is exactly and what I it looks like. Laughed and laughed and laughed. <laughs> That's too good. Uh, these bubbles, too, kind of like float up alongside the, the train car as we're driving, and they kind of almost form the shape of what looks like a human, which is kind of creepy, but then they kind of float away and dissipate after a minute. Um, and then you see them periodically if you keep playing the game and keep walking up and down the car. You'll see it a few oh, times, really? but I, didn't I think know. so. I think I've you can see it twice. I've only ever managed to see it once. Yeah, okay, yeah. I only saw it once on my most recent playthrough, but I think if you take enough time, eventually it'll trigger itself to to do it again. Maybe I'm misremembering that, but um, we do go talk to John Gray about that, get his opinion on it, and he's like, oh gosh, I had to write this down because... I know. I was like, I don't even, I'm not even going to try to explain it the way you said it, John. He says that essentially the train... Okay. (laughs) He says that the voltage from quartz crystals in the ground being compressed by the weight and speed of the train causes piezoelectricity. (laughs) Right. So the one evidence that we see on our own that we think is like the most incontrovertible evidence of a ghostly haunting, John's actually like, oh, no, actually that's a natural phenomenon. (laughs) Yeah, easy to explain. Makes it look like there's, I guess it's just sparks flying up from the train and causing it to look like there's things floating. Maybe, but... (laughs) That's our explanation for that. <laughs> Instead, John's giving us evidence of ghosts as like uh, a Polaroid with a weird line in it and like some really, really grainy audio that we have to like listen to so hard oh, yeah. to hear anything. <laughs> the lights that are basically like dancing outside of the tray and John's like, no, that's not a ghost. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> I see your next note here is about the lights flickering and shaking every time the train rattles or the glasses in the dining car kind of clinking as the train drives. It's really good. 
the train effects in this game are just really quality like yeah it, it feels like you're on a train just like the you know the audio like hearing you know obviously the rushing of the air outside but yeah also when you go into the dining car you hear just the glass is just rattling around a little bit and just like the kind of ringing that it does and they like rub up against each other and you yeah the lights flicker and you can kind of sometimes see the train car shake it's just really really good attention to detail yeah, just the whole design of this game is just so beautiful. We'll get to the town later on, but the mountains are so pretty. The train itself is so well designed. The 2D art is just impeccable, I'd say. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, okay, so at this point we go back to talk to Frank and Joe, and they say, hey, guess what? We found a record of a James Thurston who lived in the town of Copper Gorge, which happens to be where we're going anyway. Thank Perfect. Um, and he actually ended up getting married, had a wife there, and had children. So maybe we'll be able to find some other descendants or something from James Thurston when we get there. But we don't know just yet because we have a cut scene where the train, we see like a map choo, and the train choo. is like driving across the country from, I guess they left from New York, right? Or Chicago. I, okay. Listen. I thought it was Grand Central Station that they left out of at the beginning. That definitely is what it looked like. But I just cannot imagine how long a train journey from, like, New York to Colorado, which is where we're going, on an old-fashioned steam train would take. Because it certainly doesn't take us but a couple hours to (laughs) investigate. To do all the puzzles, yeah. It's got to be days of travel. Mm -hmm. So that just seems like... (laughs) It would have been nice to have, like, a overnight thing or something maybe a spook in the night or something we see nancy go to bed and then get up the next day and we're on the train for a while but whatever the train comes to a stop in copper gorge colorado yes and i love this like this setting i think is i I just find it so freaking cute because sometimes what we see in like other other games is when we go to a new location we just like automatically put into like, I, I think about The Silent Spy, where you take you take a lot of different trains to a lot of different places, but, mm-hmm. like, you don't ever, it's not like you go in and click on it, you just appear in the location after you, like, you know, go through right. the next door or whatever. But for Copper Gorge, what they give us is they give us, like, this hand-drawn, illustrated map of the town, and you can click on different locations in the town to go there. And it is so freaking cute. Mm -hmm. It is so adorable and, like, just so cool and looks so amazing. So, like, when you look on this map, you can see, like, the graveyard, which is a clickable location. And you can see, like, um, like a diner. And then you can see, like, this Copper Gorge Museum, which, when you click on it, you can go to. And we find out that this is Buell's Old Time Taffy House. Buell? Buell! We're looking for you, Buell. There you are. Um, So we go talk to... (laughs) Well, let me just say that when you enter, <laughs> I mean, it looks, I mean, it looks mostly like you would expect like an old time museum to look. There's like some historical artifacts and stuff smattered everywhere. There's some like coin operated games and stuff. And then you just turn and you see. I, I wondered for so long <laughs> what this was. <laughs> I'm still not um, sure. <laughs> person in a costume with a massive styrofoam head of uh, old miner, I guess, is what you would call this outfit. There's, like, overalls and stuff and, like, this, like, gold-toothed dude with a beard and a hat on behind the counter. So you go up and talk to them. We learn that this is Fatima, (laughs) who um, we talked to them for a while, and we find out that Buell used to own this store, and Buell was Fatima's great-grandfather. I don't know if it was great-great-grandfather. I think just great-grandfather. And the store has been passed down to Fatima. So, (laughs) it's unclear why Fatima is wearing this costume. Um, They never take it off. I (laughs) just, I, I think the answer is animation. Sure. Within the context of the game, we don't really have a reason for Fatima to be wearing this costume the whole time. But for, like, real-world purposes, I think that they did that just so that they would not have to animate another character. It is also hilarious, to be fair. It's it funny. Is, yeah, it's really funny. 
just for context, this is, I would say, probably their most ambitious game to date. One, it's the first time we've ever seen the Hardy Boys in person, so that's an additional two people that they had to animate, plus our four characters, plus Fatima. Um, we're really racking up the number of characters here when typically we've never had more than three or four in a game before. So it's just, I think that that's what it comes down to, but it's really funny the creative way or the creative solution that they came up with to explain why this person doesn't have a moving mouth or anything. It's just a head bobbling side to side because obviously there's no way to move the mouth on this helmet costume, whatever yeah. it is. <laughs> That's a great point. And I definitely hadn't thought about that, but it makes a lot of sense when you say it like that. So we talked to Fatima. We learned that Fatima is obsessed with Charlene Purcell. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, we also learned, we also asked about Jake Hurley and his stuff. Uh, but Fatima has never heard of Jake. Fatima says, I mean, his stuff may be here, but I don't know. Like, you're welcome to look around, but don't touch anything. Because it's all authentic and, you know, be very careful about the stuff. Fatima is very concerned about it. So we're like, okay, we won't, you know. <laughs> um, but we do find a trunk in there with the initials JH on it. Oh. Hey, this must be Jake Hurley's trunk. Uh, but, of course, it's locked. <laughs> However, the little spot for the mechanism looks very familiar um, because it looks just like the shape that we used to unlock another box on the train. We have this little like combination lock, but it's not numbers, it's colors. So you have to mm -hmm. get the right color order to put it in and you can move yeah. this lock around. But obviously we can't, we're not allowed to touch it. So we ask Fatima, we're like, hey, we're pretty sure the stuff's in this trunk. You know, can we try to get it open? Fatima's like, you're not going to break it, are you? Or you ain't going to break it, ain't you? And we say, oh, no, 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 absolutely not. We would never try to use force, but we will have to, you know, touch it to open it. <laughs> <laughs> and Fatima's like, eh, I'll let you touch it, but first you have to get me Charlene's autograph. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have to, to go get Charlene to sign something before we're allowed to unlock this truck. So in the, can we talk about in the Copper Gorge Museum, there are also these two mini games. Ugh, I hate them. They're so bad. They're so They're bad. kind of down to chance, so unless you get it's it entirely soon, you chance. will spend like an hour on them for no reason. Literally, Lance and I had to play the freaking horse racing one. I was like, surely it's a pattern. Surely no. it's a pattern, and I think this every time. And I was like, so if we just click the same one every single time, eventually it's going to have to roll around and pick it. Which it does, but not because it's a pattern, just from pure chance. <laughs> Completely randomized. It's so annoying. But you have to do the win the, the mini games because you have to get both of the coins from the mini games in order to get a piece of taffy out of this machine on a stick, which you'll need later. <laughs> So, <laughs> speaking of that taffy, we do also get to go to the graveyard in town, which happens to be where Jake buried Camille, because this is one of the last towns that the train was seen in, right? So we go to the graveyard to see if we can go visit Camille's grave, and we get the voice of a gravekeeper at the door. And he's it's very creepy. Uh, we don't actually see him, but he's like talking to us through the door. He's like, "Oh yeah, Camille's buried here. You're welcome to go in and see her," but. I dropped the key down the grate. So you're going to have to find a way to get this key out. Um, and there's like the grate and then the key is like in the bottom of it. So we need something long and sticky. And what else is long oh. and sticky but taffy on a stick, right? <laughs> Which is what we, <laughs> we win from those mini games. So yeah, we go into the crypt. Um, we find another slug kind of sitting in there on like this uh, kind of shelf thing. And you go in and you see her coffin. Just, you know, because it's a crypt. Um, there's also a really pretty stained glass window in there with a bunch of different colors on it. Um, and there are like these pillars in the corner. So Jake's letter mentions Camille's grave and us visiting her and seeing what will rub off on us. So <laughs> if you look around, you'll notice that the pillars have like a, like a texture to them. Um, and so Nancy realizes that rubbing or rub off must mean rubbing and so we need to take rubbings off of these pillars in the corner. Camille's coffin also has very frighteningly a lock on it. <laughs> like the same uh, Ooh, I was color so spooked lock. by this I I know, child. <laughs> I know. I was like, I'm gonna unlock it and there's gonna be a dead body. There. <laughs> yeah. 
Or like, what's going to come out of this coffin? Why right. does the coffin need a lock? <laughs> <laughs> But you'll realize that the stained glass window above Camille's coffin, the numbers, sorry, the the colors are associated with different elements, which you can find on the periodic table to figure out what lock they open. Anyway, yeah, you yeah. use this color wheel lock on Camille's grave, and instead of opening the whole coffin, it just opens like a little drawer in it, thank yeah. God, <laughs> where there is uh, another hidden gem, which you can mm-hmm. take. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty much it for the gray or for the the crypt yes oh yeah but we have to go get charlena's autograph so we go to charlena but she doesn't have a pen <laughs> so we have a pencil but she doesn't have a pen this seems bananas to me how out of two people not a single person can have a pen especially one who is an author mm-hmm. seems like they might have a pen on them i mean i guess primarily she uses her laptop but like I think it's just a, a time waster thing. They want us to go ask other people and then have to yeah. play a game. And then, yeah, it's just yes. to extend the length of the game. So we go to talk to Tino because he's the only other person on the train right now. Um, and he's like, yeah, I have a pen. Uh, but first you have to play this game or sorry, you have to play this game Leaping Lizards and beat my score. Otherwise, I won't give it to you. I love Leaping Lizards. It's so fun. Really? I like it. Yeah, I think it's a good game. You can't play the game until this scene, but after that you can go back and replay as much as you want. But I did. I spent a lot of time going back and replaying because it's just so fun. It's basically like checkers and you're trying to leave the fewest amount of pieces on the board. Yeah. It's like one player checkers. Like you don't play with anybody else. It's just you trying to leave as few pieces by jumping other pieces and removing them from the board as possible. I remember struggling so hard with this game as a child. Really? Oh no. Yeah. But I just say, when when Lance and I did it this time, we left two on the first try. Nice! Like, can yeah. you leave, Can you get it down to where you only leave one? I'm sure you can. I haven't. I haven't been able to do that. Or at least not recently. Maybe I have yeah. in the past and I don't remember. Um, but Tino left four, and so if we leave less lizards on the board than Tino, he'll give us the pen, so... He gives us <laughs> Yes. <laughs> uh, so we get the signed autograph from Charlena to go give to Fatima. I keep wanting to say Fatima because I'm pretty sure that's how <laughs> you're supposed to pronounce it. Oh, I also have to say that Fatima, they were like, it's and it's Fatima with an F, none of that weirdo PH stuff. Can I say I quote that all the time? <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's arguably one of the most iconic lines from the game. So maybe we should, like, uh, make this our audiogram. <laughs> it's just all of the quotes. It'll be, this is, is Fatima with an H, none of that weirdo PH stuff. <laughs> and then um, you just said, no, his mind's in there going 90 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, my middle name is Stephanie, which is usually a PH, but it's spelled Mine is spelled with an F, so I quote this all the time oh when gosh. people ask me how to spell my middle name because, of course, they always spell it wrong. And I'm like, no, 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 we are no PH stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and people never get it because they like, what are you talking about? But I think it's hilarious. It is hilarious. Someone validates my weird spelling. Thank you, Fatima. <laughs> <laughs> so um, while we're in there giving this to Fatima, Frank and Joe kind of pop their heads in and they say, hey, Nancy, Um, you know, they tell us they stopped at the Copper Fork, which is this diner in town for a cheeseburger because Joe really wanted a cheeseburger. Mm -hmm. Classic Joe Hardy. (sighs) Um, And when they did, they were, I guess, talking to the owner or the the staff at this diner and they said, asked about James Thurston and they said oh yeah actually a descendant of James Thurston comes to the diner regularly like, oh, how convenient okay. <laughs> um but they wouldn't tell Frank and Joe like they wouldn't point out that person to them unless they help out as a short order cook because their cook is out that day or something so guess who gets enlisted to cook the burgers <laughs> <laughs> Frank Hardy because of course Joe can't cook our first opportunity to play as a hardy boy I know Also, Frank and Joe tell us that Tino and John and Lori are all currently hiking up the mountain, just kind of aimlessly wandering, looking for Jake's mine. (laughs) We don't know why. I think Tino just decided to gather everybody up and say, let's go, guys, you know? (laughs) 
He thinks he's found it. So this is a really good opportunity for us to snoop on the train. If you go, this is now, so there's a piano in Camille's car, which we couldn't play before because it messed with John Gray's like recording equipment. Like he was like, I guess, constantly having headphones and listening to his microphone set up around the room. Very loudly, very sensitive microphones. (laughs) Hey, you know, maybe he was listening in on everybody's conversation. Just Probably. had that thought. Yeah. Anyway, um, so you can go do that. And when you play a certain thing on the piano, which you find the notes for in another <laughs> part of the train, you will, a little part of the piano will open up and give us the spyglass, the... Um, telescope. Telescope. <laughs> Thank you. I think they just call it a spyglass in I the think game, to be fair. Yeah. yeah. I, I, but for some reason, I can't bring to mind either name um the spyglass slash telescope that opens up so we have that we also at this point can go get the gemstone from the cigar clipper in tino's uh, where tino was sitting (laughs) i so at this point i always go to the back of the train because i think hey tino john and Lori are gone so let's go snoop in Lori's stuff but you can't there's nothing to snoop and lori stuff and lori is already back by the time that you make it there mm-hmm. um but if you talk to her she tells you about like their outing and we basically learn that they find like this structure which lori doesn't know what it is but it's just like this shack out in the woods and tino said he it was a mine so he started digging in it and then she doesn't say this she like alludes to it but basically tino mistook an outhouse for a mine went in and dug up literal shit <laughs> in the outhouse <laughs> looking for gold he was he was <laughs> <laughs> digging a shit metaphor. out of an outhouse looking for gold. He's what a metaphor. Panning for gold. Like, in an outhouse. <laughs> I can't. I can't. It's, it's, it hits on too many levels. So we decide to go back to Buell's at this point, um, and we get Jake's lamp from that box that we were able to open, but the pickaxe isn't there. We still can't find the pickaxe, so we go ask Fatima about it. She says, oh yeah, I've got that upstairs. I use it to open my coconuts. <laughs> Uh, she's like, well, you know, I'm not going to have anything to open my coconuts anymore, but if you really need it, you can borrow it. If you do me a little favor real quick. Um, I need some taffy sorted. So there's this machine in the back. Go sort the taffy and you can use the pickaxe after after I go get it while you're doing the taffy. So we start sorting the taffy, but we do also find some wax paper back there. And Fatima's like, yeah, you can have a piece and we're going to use that wax paper to go do the rubbings from the grave. Yeah, we get the pickaxe and then call it's frank he is at the diner right now and he is making the burgers and he says that the descendant from james thurston the engineer has actually come into the diner and he's actually got a lady friend with him that he is trying to impress with stories of his great grandfather's tales of his time in the mines right but so we have this little mini game where frank makes burgers we basically find out more information about this mine and there's this like not a poem, but sort of, I don't even know what to call it. It's yeah. instruction, basically. It's just a string of phrases that yes. that this guy was sworn to remember by his father, who was sworn to remember by his father, who was James Thurston, the engineer on the train, to remember and remember for Jake. Um, basically, yeah, we learned that Jake was nice, but very eccentric, and basically made him swear to remember this, to tell his son, and then his son, and then his son. We also kind of learned through this, I wanted to mention this too, because I just thought this was so, like, on the nose. We learned that Camille, so she died, she died a couple years before Jake went missing, Um, and we learned that she died, and we never really knew the cause of her death, but we learned that she actually died after hitting her head, falling from a dizzy spell due to the heat. Mm. But she got up after that fall and was fine. But then she went to go rest and then was dead a few hours later. Mm. So I would just like to point out to everyone that these are the actual consequences of uh, untreated concussion. 
Um, and <laughs> if you ever hit your head, you should be very careful. Okay, thank you. End of my story. Uh, let's see. So we also learn, and I want to bring this up too because I want to talk about this later. He tells us that his grandfather, so the uh, engineer on the train, died on the train. We knew that already. But he tells us that the door to the engine was locked and barred from the inside like he was trying to keep someone out. Hmm. Spooky. We got to talk about that later. Yes. <laughs> And yeah, and he told him that the way he drove the train and kind of worked out this system with Jake Hurley is that Jake would ask him to kind of drive slow through the Blue Moon Canyon area so that Jake could jump off the train at some point and the engineer wouldn't even know where Jake had gotten off. So this is how Jake Hurley hid his mine from everybody. Literally no one knew the location of this mine except for Jake. But so, the phrase that he is sworn to remember is, The eye of the tiger is fixed on a star, Zircon lies in fingers that scar, Amethyst floats in a hand from the deep, Citrine is what the foul mouth shall keep, Tourmaline by a soft arm ensnared, Peridot rests at the foot of the mare. We remember those little yeah. gem holders from the mechanical car. Obviously, this is telling us which gem goes with which holder thing, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So after we wrap up this part where we're in the diner, we are automatically flashed back to the train where we're talking to Frank and Joe about what we just heard. Frank and Joe show us that they found a letter in the caboose from Samuel Clemens, a.k.a. Mark Twain. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, apparently, he and Jake were pen pals. And so Frank is like, I'm of course going to turn this over to Lori, but I had to show you first because it's just so cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's also really funny because Joe doesn't know who Samuel Clemens is and is like, I mean, why are you guys freaking out about it? It's not like the guy's Mark Twain or something. And <laughs> Nancy and Frank just are kind of like have this long pause like, dude, come on. <laughs> Anyway, at this point, um, you can go get the rubbings from the crypt. Once you take the rubbings, you say that it says, or you see that they all say wisdom, charity, purity, eternity in like a different, in like a configuration. And if you remember, there's this <sighs> embroidered <Sometimes> sampler. <laughs> trying to describe how to solve these puzzles is like, it's just so ridiculous that it's kind of like, it just it doesn't even really matter. <laughs> it's hard to translate all the visual aspects to the podcast, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Basically, there's a book that tells you what those words mean. And if you use the sampler, you can translate those into numbers, which will unlock the pipes, the last pipes, mm -hmm. last bit of pipes in the sleeper car, which you can solve. And then all the pipes are connected. Um, so you have to go back to the mechanical room and then basically put everything that you have where it needs to go. You need to put all the gems into all the different containers based on um, the phrase that the engineer passed down. You need to put the lamp in the right spot, the spyglass <laughs> telescope thing yes. in the right spot, and then turn it on. So you pull the pickaxe and that's our lever. And this activates probably the most amazing animation in so good. all of any of the games. It's, it's so hard to describe because the colors are so beautiful and everything just kind of weirdly floats. It's, it sounds insane describing it, but it's very pretty when you actually get to see it. But essentially the gems start spinning around really quickly so that the light from the spyglass goes through the gems. And then there's something the carbide and the lamp makes uh, the light go through and then eventually they will like pinpoint a bit of light onto the bit of the map because it also raises the map up to the right spot and then essentially we're supposed to know that the the light that it's or the the place on the map where the light has kind of pinpointed is the location of the mine the most complicated unnecessary mechanical Unrealistic. setup <laughs> Very beautiful, very cool uh, mm -hmm. on her interactive part, but like, why would someone do this? Why it would anyone do this? For real. It's not how projectors work. Just hide the map and how to find the map and, and where on the map and how to find the marking on the map. That's all you have to do. You don't have to build an entire car of your train to include like this weird angled map table that can move with a projector that needs a specific pickaxe 
not any pickaxe, a specific pickaxe and yep. lamp and, and spyglass and gems <laughs> that make a color, which also the light that ends up flashing onto the map isn't a color. It's just it's white. white. Um, it's, it's very odd, but yeah, anyway. Um, so we, we go and tell everybody, hey, found the location of the map. So we get another little cut scene where we see the map and the train traveling across the U.S. I think it actually ends up in, like, Nevada. I don't think we're even in Colorado at the end. Yeah. Um, so we go tell Lori, hey, we need to head for Brimstone Canyon. And she's like, great, I'll tell the engineer. Let's go. But, so... Lori tells us before we get there that, like, okay, I'll let you be the first person to check out the mine. Just make sure to not steal anything because everything in the mine belongs to me. We're like, okay, Lori, chill out. Whatever. Um, And (laughs) so, yeah, we get to the canyon and we immediately step off the train. And then as we step off the train and start walking into the canyon, we hear the train start up and move along without us. And it disappears. (laughs) We're Which, like, why? Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, I know why now, but like, <laughs> yeah. That's, which is confusing. So it's like, well, why would Lori move the train? Maybe she doesn't want anybody to follow us. So in this canyon, <laughs> though, we come up to like this, you know, obviously we see the mine where it's kind of blocked by a bunch of fallen rocks. We also see a cannon. Like a fully functioning loaded cannon <laughs> that we basically are able to light using the sun and like a magnifying glass scenario. It was so considerate of Jake to put that there for us in case there was a rock slide that blocked the entrance to his mine. How? Well, presumably he put the rocks there on purpose. Oh, okay. Presumably. We need to talk. We also need to talk about this later too because okay. I have serious questions and thoughts about this. But, um,. Why and how is there a fully functioning cannon, loaded canyon, cannon in this, in this canyon? Sorry, cannon and canyon are two very similar yes. words. <laughs> how is it possible that after all of these years, because it's been like, what, a hundred years, basically? Easily. Well, yeah, this was 1903 that it was abandoned. This is 2005, the game. Right. So it's been a hundred years of this cannon just sitting here. How is it that the wick hasn't gotten or the fuse hasn't gotten wet or disintegrated right it's sitting in this hot sun an animal hasn't come and chewed it like <laughs> what? or something knocked the thing that's covering it off yeah. the thing that's covering the glass that ignites yeah. it how has it not already been set off but huh. anyway so but we fire the cannon which <laughs> way to go us um which knocks the landslide kind of out of the way and we're able to enter the mine and i just i know that this is not dangerous because this is a video game and we obviously can't die in any of these situations because we're actually sitting on the couch in our living room playing this game but just the thought of like going into a mine that has been sealed off for a hundred years makes me super nervous yeah i feel like this gives like bad bad advice to people like please don't go into any enclosed space that has been sealed for a long period of time because you don't know what the air composition is like in there and very easily there can be very bad (laughs) gases down there that if you breathe them in uh you can die so don't do that don't do that (laughs) Mm -hmm. you will die pretty quickly actually it's and you won't know that you're dying so yeah it's just mm -hmm. will start happening you'll just start losing oxygen you'll get very sleepy and then you won't be able to make it out Lovely. <laughs> Luckily, that doesn't happen to Nancy, but it could have, is all I'm saying. That could have been a very real situation that she got herself into. <laughs> also, our um, color combination lock from earlier is now magical and can point yes! us the direction that we need to go through. through how the does mind. it work, Corey? How does it work? And how how do the lizards know the right way to... Th- That's my thing. It's like, okay... So when we walk into the mine, suddenly Nancy (laughs) realizes, oh, my, you know, my color wheel seems to be pointing in specific directions. And we realize that it's associated with like lizards, different colored lizards on the wall of this uh, cave, this mine that points us to which direction we need to go. Okay, two things. Let's assume that there is some fancy technology that Jake Hurley invented or, you know, used to allow this color wheel to 
point, point at lizards. Point at lizards, let's say. <laughs> I don't know how, but maybe that's a possibility. How do the lizards not move? How do how are the lizards always in the same spot in the canyon or in the in the, in the mine that tells us which which direction turn left or right? Maybe this is a a case study in evolution where only <laughs> red lizards have evolved from this side of the tunnel, only blue ones down this hallway of the tunnel, whatever you call it. This offshoot. Is, this has got to be the <sighs> biggest plot hole <laughs> in this game then this part i mean there are parts of it that don't make sense this part really doesn't make any sense it could have been that they were just like colored lights in the wall or yeah. like a picture of a color different minerals or something yeah why lizards why lizards why why not <laughs> We can have a um, gemstone-powered projector that operates off of carbide, but... Well, they should have put gemstones in the wall. There should have been more gems in the wall. That would have at least tracked with the gemstones before. Yeah. And and we could understand something about maybe it's attracted to certain gemstone colors, or you know? Mm -hmm. But anyway, so... (laughs) When you follow the lizards, you eventually get to a chamber... Or, like, a series of sticks holding up a bunch of rocks. <laughs> I don't know how else to describe it. No, that's it. <laughs> um, and there are, like, all these symbols on these, like, little... Uh, they're not little sticks. They're, like, big sticks. They're, like, two by a four. Post. Four by four. Yeah. Post, yeah. And there's a certain order that you have to pull out these pillars in order to safely pass underneath all of these rocks. Mm. I never do this. I never do this one. I always look up the answer to this one. (laughs) It's what the binder's for. Because, yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's like Lance says thank you so much for making that binder because he absolutely did not want to do the doll puzzle. He was like, Mm. I don't care to look at it. I always skip that. (laughs) I like that one. I like the doll one. I don't like this one. Um, You're supposed to have like seeing different symbols as you walk through the uh, mine there are different sticks or symbols hidden Mm -hmm. on different things throughout it and you're supposed to pull them in that specific order right but i always miss them and i never do that and so (laughs) it just triggers a rock slide if you get it wrong and then you die again yeah or sometimes what i do instead of looking it up is i just do trial and error (laughs) that works which also works But once we get through that, we get to the final chamber, which is a, there's like a series of little train tracks for the minecarts running through there. So this is, I think this is where like the minecarts start. But when we get into this chamber, we see the skeleton of Jake Hurley on the ground. We found Jake. Finally. He dead. I mean, we knew he was dead, but like now we know for sure he's dead. Yes, of course. A hundred years later, (laughs) we find out that he did die in his mines and he is actually clutching two pieces of paper. One of those is a photo of Camille. Kept her with him to his last moments. How sweet. But then the other is a letter from Abraham Lincoln. Dated April 14th, which is the night he was assassinated. The night he was assassinated, Corey! Abraham we Lincoln, have... on the night he was assassinated, sent this letter to Jake Hurley. I'm sorry. We have this letter written to his <laughs> pen pal Jake, stamped with the presidential seal, sent hours before his death. Priceless letter. So we can conclude there was no gold mine, or there is no gold. There is the mine, obviously, but Jake never found any sort of gold or minerals or gemstones here. His greatest treasure was this letter that he had that is now worth, like, millions, basically. Yeah. Yeah. So we're standing in... (laughs) Amazing. We're standing in the, the mine. We've just read this letter, and then we look up, and then we hear some footsteps coming up behind us, and we turn, and here... Here is the spoiler. I'm just going to let everybody know. I mean, we spoiled all the puzzles already. But if you wanted to do this game and make it to the end and not hear kind of the big reveal at the end, stop now, finish the game, and come back. So we hear these footsteps coming up behind us and we turn and Lori is there. Um, And Lori is like, oh, hey, you found it. You know, thanks. And so she reaches in and grabs the letter out of our hands. Um, And she explains to us that, you know, actually, when she first came onto the train, in addition to finding that letter that Jake left to his niece, 
she also found his diary. Um, and after mm. reading his diary, he mentioned find or having this letter from Abraham Lincoln and knowing that because he was assassinated right after, you know, he sent it, knew how valuable this letter was going to be. So knew that this, this letter was his treasure. And Lori realized that she needs to find that letter and th that this is the treasure. She never cared about finding the mine. She just wanted the letter. Um, and now that Nancy has found it, Lori is like, well, great. Now I can say that I found the letter. And Nancy's like, wait, Lori, what are you talking about? I found the letter. And Lori is like, oh my gosh, you know what would be like the most amazing story is like if I tell everyone that you drug me out here and it was like super scary. Um, and then there was like this cave in um, and I tried to save you, but you did something stupid and got yourself killed. Um, but I bravely make it out by myself. <laughs> And Nancy's like, Lori, what? No, wait, hold on, hold on. Let's talk about this. You can have the letter, no problem. And she's like, sorry, Nancy. And then she kicks one of those posts over, and a rock slide happens. Mm -hmm. And Nancy is now trapped in this cave with Jake Hurley's skeleton. <laughs> <laughs> but we still have that minecart track. Right. So what else are we to do <laughs> but to jump in the car and just set off down this set of tracks that we have no idea where they lead or if they even lead out of the mine. Why? But we're going. Corey. Why? <laughs> why doesn't she just walk? Oh, I think it kind of like goes over some some spaces that you couldn't walk down. But you could, I mean, yeah. if there's a track, you can walk on the track or, you know, crawl on the track. No, we're going to trust that it's still structurally sound, and we're just going to get Which, in it like it's a roller coaster cart. By the way, it is definitely not. I don't know if you watch the animation, but literally the train tracks, the, or the cart tracks, are not supported by anything but air in very right. many places. <laughs> right. There's nothing holding it up. Not good. Anyway, you're supposed to navigate through this. There are, like, these danger signs, and you need to click to turn to the right direction to eventually escape. Lance had the hardest time doing this. I don't know really? why. I always thought it was so easy, but he could not do it for the life of him. I had to take over and do, do it. The answer's in the binder, Lance. Come oh. on. <laughs> well, I think he couldn't get the timing right. Like, he couldn't oh, okay. um, He couldn't click at the right time. Like, he was always clicking too early or too late oh, to gotcha. get it to turn. Anyway. Well, if he knew better, he would already know exactly <laughs> where he needs to place the mouse and the by timing. The way, and... By the way, right. Come and on, I realize Lance. that, like, I only know this because I've played the game so long right. and I just understand how to do no, it. No, I'm totally kidding. <laughs> by the way, I just want to let everybody know that the binder that we keep talking about, <laughs> if we, I don't know that we mentioned this before, but Corey, after years and years and years, this has been a 15 year project <laughs> has made a binder with a comprehe a comprehensive binder of all the puzzle solutions for every single Nancy Drew game that exists sans Midnight in Salem right there's no Midnight in Salem one and I don't have one for the dossiers either but I do have all the rest of them including remastered and and it is so and she made me a copy of it <laughs> and it's so helpful that we used it a lot when my husband and I were playing this game so anyway, Nancy, yeah, rides through this mine cart down this essentially roller coaster. Um, oh my god, I just had the best idea. Sorry, another side note. What if there was a Nancy Drew theme park? Oh my god. There would definitely be a haunted house. Definitely a mine cart roller coaster. <laughs> That'd be amazing. It would be like a escape room, but theme park <gasps> style. Oh my gosh. Okay, Simon and Schuster, give us There'd a call. Be, there had to be a carousel, <laughs> yes, right? Carousel. Of course, of course. Obviously an arcade with like all of the different games that exist in all the different arcade games. The Barnacle Blast and... Be restaurants where you could get the food from the games. Oh my gosh, yes! Bangers and Mash and Loop de Loop <laughs> and Pinky and Perky and a dog's eye. Cheeseburgers. Oh my god, so many cheeseburgers. <laughs> Oh, gosh, this is the best idea. There has to be one of the the ship rides that swing oh, really yes. wildly. Yes. yes. It could okay. be the Hurlicide. Yes. <laughs> okay, sorry. Such a good idea. This is, this is a genius idea. Too bad. 
let her interact. <laughs> Simon and Schuster, give us a call. We can talk licensing. Oh my god. And funding. Um <laughs> anyway, sorry, sorry, sorry. So Nancy rides down this roller coaster mine track, um, in this mine car, and um, is able to basically ride through like a blocked entrance in the mine and then escapes the mine. And very conveniently, just as we are, you know, click, click, clicking out of this, um, you know, mine on our little cart, we run into Lori as she literally crash into Lori as she's making her escape. Who's walking on the tracks for some reason? Like uh, an idiot. <laughs> And um, the letter just kind of floats to the ground. And at this exact moment, Frank and Joe come over and are like, hey, there you are, Nancy. We noticed that, you know, you and Lori weren't on the train anymore. So we immediately jumped off to try to find you. Okay. Party boys. They literally jumped off a moving train for Nancy. For Nancy Drew. Tell me that was not Frank Hardy's idea. I know. Tell me he was not so upset. That Nancy could be in danger, that he's like, Joe, we have to go, we have to go right now. And they Joe, who is, of course, her. ride or die, is like, okay, Frank, let's do it. And they jump <laughs> off of the train. Thank you, Hardy Boys. We can always count on you. Oh my God! <laughs> so at the final wrap-up, we have a little letter that we're writing to Hannah after the end of the mystery. And uh, we learned that after Lori's father found out about all of her... Everything that Lori did, all the illegal stuff she did, he basically cut her off, cut all of her credit cards, took the train away from her. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Time out. Are we supposed to understand that that is just, quote unquote, just punishment for Lori's crimes? No, it's not. It's attempted murder. She needs to go to jail. Right? (laughs) Doesn't Tino even, like, end up pursuing something romantic with her in the end? Or was Mm -hmm. that just, Mm -hmm. okay, yeah. It's alluded to, yeah. Uh, but Tino told reporters, now Tino is like getting lauded as having helped with solving this mystery. But he says, no, I let the Hardy Boys and Nancy figure it out so that they could, you know, get their spot in the limelight for once. Because, you know, I get all the limelight anyway. I don't need it. <laughs> Stupid. Jeez, uh... We do also get a little argument between John and Charlena at the end. She calls him a crackpot. He calls her a hack. You know, just some wonderful last minute jabs there. <laughs> Um, And it turns out, yes, obviously, Jake's letter is worth a fortune. He spent his whole life searching for gold, but the real treasure was the friends he made along the way. (laughs) Classic. Classic. Oh, my gosh. So you're telling me that this man was walking around with a priceless letter from Abraham Lincoln and was still looking for gold? Like, give up, dude. Go live your life. I just don't understand. So clearly, clear. Okay, I'm sorry. Let's just jump right in because I yes. have so many things to say about Let's this. Let's go for it. Clearly, he wanted his niece to find this treasure, which is the letter, right? Mm-hmm. He gave her, he, he left the train to her. He sent her this letter with, you know, all this information or whatever. He wanted her to find it. Why is it that in all the time he spent making these preparations, he couldn't just sell this letter? And then give the money to his niece. Or just track her down and just give her the letter and Give her the physical letter. Or mail the letter to her. Lock the letter in a box or something that he designs and then give her the box rather than relying on your engineer to pass down this phrase from generation to generation and then count on those people to keep passing it down so that someday someone can hopefully put it all together. And, like, the thing that everybody knows about, like, if you're worried you're worried about potentially other people claiming this or whatever, the thing everybody thinks is that you found a gold mine. So they're not yeah. going to look in, like, a small safe on your train. Right. They're looking for a huge pile they're of gold. They're looking for the mine with the gold or the gold somewhere else. You know what I mean? Right. Like, I don't think it's really a concern. <laughs> So anyway, so Ugh. there's that that I just don't understand. But I think what I really, really, really want to talk about and what I didn't even realize until Lance had brought this up to me, which is part of why I enjoy playing this with him so much. I, I really, if you've played these games over and over so many times, I really recommend finding a friend who hasn't played them before to play them with because there is something so much fun about you just being like, well, yeah, it's just, 
you just do that thing. Well, obviously, you know, it's like this. Where the other person is, like, baffled. They're like, actually, this makes no fucking sense. <laughs> what do you mean there's lizards? Like, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, and you being like, oh, yeah, actually, you're right. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. <laughs> It's just a whole fun new way to experience the game. But anyway, so Lance brought this up to me, and I was like, oh my god, you're right. So, a couple things. <laughs> Here's what we learned. We, you know, we learned that Jake Hurley went missing. We learned that his train was found with his engineer dead on board. And now we know he was locked into the engine room from the inside as if he was hiding, like hiding from someone or someone was Keep, trying to get in something or something. locked out, yeah. Right. So... Jake Hurley, <laughs> he goes through all of these preparations to set up this essentially treasure hunt, right? He goes to the mine to die? Question mark, question mark, question mark. That can't have been his plan, can it? I don't understand how it can't have been. Because, I mean, like, I think what what we have to believe based on the scenario is that he went there to either slowly starve to death or commit suicide. Because you think, like, he's set all... Which I could see, right? Because he's he has the picture of his wife and he's, you know, distraught he's got his over her death. treasure. Dad, right? Yeah. Um, it's very dark, and I can understand why they don't make that very clear in the game. Um, but I can see that as being, like, a logical thing, right? Because you think all of this stuff has been set up. There's a rock slide over the front of the mine, which seems to have been placed there purposefully. Like, that can't have been an accident because the cannon was there on purpose. Right. Right? Loaded and ready to go. How did he place that many had, big rocks? And he, could, he had to have either had a second way in and out of that mine, which we which learn I'm later. I'm sure he did. We learn later that there is because Nancy goes out of it. Right. Um. So maybe he was, okay, maybe he was thinking like, hey, I'll set this up, then I'll go out the back way, but for some reason gets trapped and then dies. That could also be an explanation. But he sets up all of this stuff, dies in there. So there's, three, yeah, three options. Either goes in there, gets trapped, dies, goes in there on purpose to die, either by his own hand or over time, which seems very dark, which I hope mm-hmm. is the case. Or somebody else killed him in there. Mm-hmm. And you know why I think it's that third one, Corey? Because the engineer. Because the engineer. Who the heck was the engineer trying to keep out of the train? Why did the engineer bar himself in that engine room? Hmm. We, that's think, never explained. At some point we say, I think there's some reference to possibly the engineer having had a heart attack, yes. which is why it, the train just eventually rolled to a stop in Copper Gorge. So that kind of explains that. But anything before that, we have no, no clue about. Well, but also, like, even if he did have a heart attack... That doesn't explain why he was locked in the engine room from the inside. Right, of course not. Why would he lock, like, why would he bar the door from the inside? Right. So we know why he died, but nothing else that led up to it or like it what gave him the heart attack. attack. Right, what, right. what spooked him enough or did right. he just have heart or health problems, heart problems that just perfect timing right then? Who knows? So here's what I think. Jake okay. is part of the Illuminati. <laughs> oh, Okay. <laughs> There has to be something that is hand in hand with Abraham Lincoln's assassination, right? He has this letter. He was friends with Abraham Lincoln. He has to know something about this assassination. Someone learns that he has the letter from Abraham Lincoln. Maybe the the letter from Abraham Lincoln has some kind of clue as to what really happened that night and who's really responsible for the assassination of Abraham Mm. Lincoln. They don't want that letter getting in the wrong hands. They chase, you know, Jake Hurley knows they're coming. He knows the time's up, right? He said all these clues. He sent this letter to um, his niece or whatever in the nick of time. He has to get off the the train. They're all pointed to the treasures in the mine. So unless he planned to just leave that letter there forever, which why? Because the elements would have worn away at the paper over time, making it useless, damaged. Right. He had to know that someone was coming for him and that his time was getting short enough enough to be able to warn the engineer, go hide and lock himself in this mine, and either be killed by someone and them not realizing that he has the letter, which seems unlikely because he had it. (laughs) literally right next to his heart or he goes into the mine and kills himself 
to prevent anybody, you know, else from taking it from him or whatever. But I just don't understand how something or someone then goes after the engineer. Is yeah. it the ghost of Abraham Lincoln? That the <laughs> it's either the Illuminati or ghosts. That's the only way to explain it. John Wilkes Booth was after Jake Hurley. <laughs> No, he was already arrested by this point. He was arrested, like, right after. Oh, so it's one of his supporters. Who worked with John Wilkes Booth? Do you remember National Treasure 2? <laughs> Who doesn't? <laughs> I'm pretty sure, I, do, I, I vaguely remember it, but I'm pretty sure that John Wilkes Booth in, in National Treasure 2 was a part of, like, some secret society or something. And he was really innocent or something mm, of that nature. Oh, or maybe, I don't remember. Maybe he wasn't the sole. Yeah. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> so that's what I put to you guys. What the heck is that about? Never thought about this. Who killed Jake? How did Jake die? Okay. All right, so guys. Story. It's not very clear cut. <laughs> send us an email. Find us on Instagram. Let us know what your theories are. Tell us your theories. We need to know what happened to Jake Curley for real. They don't make no sense. I'm telling you, the explanation they give us don't make no sense. Maybe it was the carbon monoxide that got him. <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> I feel like that would have damaged the letter, though, at least. So, hmm. Yeah, maybe that's why he's just laying on the ground. I feel like carbon carbon monoxide would damage a letter less than oxygen would. Fair. I don't know. I, I, I actually, I take it back, I have no idea. I have no clue. <laughs> that's the case. Absolutely no idea about chemistry, so... <laughs> Yeah, me neither. Uh, the, a lizard could have come along and grabbed that paper and eaten it, you know? Oh my god, yes, yeah, the lizard! <laughs> How did the lizards survive in there? What are they eating? What do you think they ate? There's <gasps> only a skeleton left. Oh my god! <laughs> Corey, ow! I'm sorry. Ooh. Maybe Jake's ghost haunted the engineer, and that's what spooked him, because he was like, oh, you're ready to go, Jake, mm. but then you realize it's not Jake, it's a ghost. Mm-hmm. Because Jake mm -hmm. was already dead before the engineer died. It just, I mean, it really, it stinks because it could have been so much better explained to us. Like, I feel like the story would make so much more sense if we had reason to believe that the train was actually haunted instead of just all of the clues to it being haunted being kind of discredited because, um the lights or whatever was discredited by John and the evidence he gives to us is like the Polaroid, which we don't really believe. And like this audio clip, which is like also not very convincing evidence. And then our piezoelectricity isn't right. even, it's discounted right away. If only we had seen something or experienced something that was unexplained still. And that would have, like, made us be like, well, I don't know, maybe it is haunted. That I think we could understand why the engineer would be scared of being on this train alone. Right. <laughs> and have a heart attack out of fear and bar the door from, like, a potential ghost situation or something. But we, that's very clearly not the case. Like, we know that, that the train isn't that haunted. So, what is the reason? What was the reason? It's Fatima. It was Buell. He, um... <laughs> No, I'm kidding. Okay. Jake and Camille. We have to yes. talk about these two. Okay. Well, we have to talk about Jake and Camille, and we have to talk about um, Tino and Lori. Yep. Yes. Yes. So we learned from Charlena pretty early on that Jake was 35 years old when he met, quote, a young French woman named Camille. We don't ever get her age, but he is 35 years old, marrying a, quote, unquote, young woman. How old do we want to guess that Camille was? I don't know, Corey, but she was certainly obsessed with dolls. You know, we do see a picture of her mm -hmm. once. She looks twice. Twice? We see, well, we see one of her and Jake together in, like, next to the bar oh, where right. Charlene is, and then the photo picture of her with the dolls. dolls. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I was just thinking about the one with the doll. But she doesn't look, she doesn't look old or young to me. You know what I mean? I would say probably about 17. Yeah. If I had to guess, she's definitely wearing, um, like, you know, an adult woman's clothes. She's wearing, like, a corset and stuff. So it's really hard to tell, um, like, developmentally wise how old she might be. But I would guess either, you know, 17, 18. <laughs> I would hope she's at least 18, but... Yeah. You think not? 
Uh, yeah, I, I think she's definitely a teenager. I can't imagine she's older than, like, 20. And, you know, having a bunch of dolls around. Not that there's no. anything wrong with owning dolls or collecting dolls, because there's definitely... I mean, that can absolutely be an interesting hobby, but, like, it just seems like... Like a youthful have, hobby. Yes, a very youthful hobby that we haven't quite grown out of yet, because we're still a teenager, and then some 35-year-old swoops us out of France and marries us in a canyon in Colorado. We, I mean, I think, I don't know how much they describe it, but they do also allude to her being, like, really lively and, like, kind of carefree um, and kind of like a partier-ish, kind of. Yeah, I mean, we know she's got this whole, like, dance party car, you know. Right, right. Um, So, like, kind of context clues we can kind of put together that she's, like, you know, she likes to have fun, that kind of thing, and not very serious, right? She likes singing and dancing, that kind of stuff. Playing piano, yeah. Oh, which is, like, very, I would imagine, typical pursuits available to young women at the time. So, like, Mm -hmm. nothing unusual, especially if, like, you know, she's upper class, right? Like, she's... Mm -hmm. She's got a lot of free time, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that all makes sense, but it does certainly give us the impression of, like, youthfulness, um, either in age or in demeanor. And in contrast to Jake Hurley, who is not old by any means, but, like, is definitely portrayed as being, like, this guy who has quite, like, quite a bit of agency. Like, mm-hmm. obviously... He's rich. He's purchased this train. He's apparently some kind of mechanical genius where he can create, like, these (laughs) complex machines and, you know, has a lot of also other wealthy and powerful friends. He's Mm -hmm. friends with the President of the United States. He's friends with Mark Mark Twain. Twain. Right. (laughs) All of these are, like, confirmed, like, we know that, right? So, like, he's this kind of essentially a mover and a shaker we're supposed to understand compared to this girl who likes to dance and play with her dolls and it's like Mm -hmm. that's what is like concern and also it's concerning to me not because they they shouldn't be together or you know he shouldn't have married her or anything but the fact that yeah he drags her to this canyon in colorado where she dies she dies she hits her head Mm -hmm. because she passed out from heat stroke probably from wearing a corset on an unair conditioned train in nevada yep and dies (laughs) and that's the other thing too putting her on a train and just driving this the three of them jake camille and the engineer through the desert this poor girl no wonder she had all these dolls. She had no one else to talk to just these grown men that are driving her through the desert isolated disempowered Young. These are Taking not away from her family, countries away. You these know. are not good. This is not a good relationship dynamic, it seems. But Charlena assures us that they were very in love. Yes. Whatever that means for an 18, 17, 18 year old girl and a 35 year old man. I think it means that probably Jake was very obsessed. Yeah. <laughs> Which is fine, you know, whatever. Yeah. He certainly felt remorseful, I think. So that's, you know, that's definitely something to think about, right? I wish they told us how old she was, but they don't. I mean, of course they're not going to, right? There's lots of reasons to not put in details like that. And a lot of it has to do with these are games for, you know, children. young girls, for children, mm-hmm. right? They are marketed, I think, for ages 10 and up, right? Right. So. so we can't put anything in them that's illegal today, like child marriage. Um, I mean, I say child marriage is illegal today. <laughs> it's not Uh, a lot of places um so um, at a lot of places in the united states sorry that's like a a hot button topic for me no it is for me as well i'll talk all day (laughs) of course this is the reason why we were such a good friends um the reason the podcast is always three hours (laughs) we're just talking about all these feminist issues um (laughs) and another thing nancy needs to be doing no (laughs) Um, so yeah, but like, obviously they're not going to say, oh, Camille was, you know, 14 years old when she got married to this 35 year old man. Mm -hmm. They're not going to tell that to 12 year old girls. Um, and also, you know, like stuff with uh, how Jake maybe died by his own hand, that kind of stuff. So like, yeah, but it certainly makes it interesting to theorize about as an adult. Of course. Okay. We have to talk about Tino and Lori. 
First of all, I just hate Tina so much. They're both... He's awful. ...deplorable characters. So in a way, it's kind of like, well, I mean, you know, they end up together. Perfect for each other. Perfect for each other, <laughs> right. Um, because Lori literally tries to murder us. Mm-hmm. I mean, not murder us, but leaves us to die um, purposely. Leaves us to be crushed to death. And, and Tino is a patronizing, patriarchal, gross man who... Who's self-absorbed. Self-absorbed, like so narcissistic and so Ugh. obsessed with his image. Yeah. So fine. Whatever. Like calls to like, I guess. But how old do you think Lori is? 22 maybe maybe maybe. 20 to 25 somewhere in there how old do you think tino is easily 30 he's got to be way older than 30 Corey. i think he's got to be in his late 40s or like mid to late 40s oh yeah i wouldn't be surprised he's supposed to be this cop well okay i guess maybe you could say 30s to 40s but like just the way that he comes off as this new york cop new york detective who's worked his way up the rank like that takes time that takes a lot of time and also skill which he does not have right well (laughs) true true he's had a dumb luck situation where he crashed oh we never talked about too the fact that he the reason why he got famous was not because he actually solved a case but because he rear-ended criminals after a bank robbery on accident while he was like going to or while they were like going to get food or something yeah (laughs) But anyway, yeah, no, I find the age gap in that relationship to be slightly concerning as well. Mm-hmm. You know, not because I think that, like, a 22-year-old and, like, a 40-year-old can't go out. But, like, I find that dynamic and power to be quite off. Um, and also that, like, Tino is portrayed as being, like, a cop. And Lori is portrayed as being, like, this essentially silly young girl who has no responsibility and no consequences to like her actions you know she's very different very different worlds and levels of power and agency yep very concerning to me and none of these relationships are portrayed as being bad and not romantic and even nancy like plays up kind of being the go-between between between Lori and tino and kind of repairing their relationship you why do we care? They're both awful people. Yeah, want to help that. them get together. I mean, and then also Jake and Camille's relationship was portrayed as being like this romantic thing, and she died, and he was heartbroken, right? Mm-hmm. Mm. I don't feel good about it. Don't feel good no. about that. It's weird. I also hate that. Sorry, this is a little off topic, but every yeah. time we speak to Tina, we end up having to thank him for his help or. <sighs> Uh, just like, Ugh. oh, you were so helpful. Thank you. You're so smart for figuring that out. Why do we have to go through all that? We're not reporting to Tino. We mm-hmm. don't have to do anything to, like, convince him to help us. We don't have to say, oh, thank you for your help, Tino. We we'll just be like, all right, see you later. Like, we say see you later to all the other characters. We don't be like, oh, thank you so much for your time and your help. And, yeah. oh, my gosh. It's like we got to jerk him off to make him feel like he's a competent man policeman. But why? He doesn't... Like, for his no own reason. ego's sake, so that he doesn't get angry and kill everybody, because that's what white men do when they're angry. I'm sorry. <laughs> it sucks that we have to do that. Yeah. I hate it. I hate it, because there's no option. I, I totally understand why they didn't let the character be rude to him as Nancy, that she mm-hmm. handles it very neutrally so and level-headed. Yeah. I want to cuss him out if it were my <laughs> choice to like write in what Nancy says to him. Yeah, I think, I mean, it definitely doesn't come off this way, but I think it could be, you could put the argument forward that Nancy does that in order to, you know, I mean, it's slightly true as to what I was saying as to, like, you know, make him feel good and helpful, right, so that we can get more out of him in the future, basically just trying to get him to work with us, right? She's being her normal, charming, kind of manipulative self. Yeah. But it doesn't it doesn't come off that way when you play it. No. Ugh, I'm sorry. I just hate Tino so much. He is definitely, I think, in a ranking of these characters, he is my least favorite. He's one of my least favorite of all the games. Mm, yeah. Ooh, do you want to rank all the characters? <laughs> <gasps> yeah, let's do it. Okay, so let's think. I think we should 
discount Frank and Joe because obviously um, if Frank and Joe are in the mix, I am going to rate them number one. Like mm-hmm. Frank Hardy number one, Joe Hardy number two. That's just how that's just how it works. So we'll just discount mm-hmm. them and Nancy. Yes. So we've They're not got... suspects. We'll rank the suspects. What about... Okay, but my favorite oh, character... Oh, Fatima. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, then. Sure. Yeah, you're right, you're right, right. So um, we've got Tino. We have John Gray. We've got Lori. We have... Fatima, we have James Thurston's descendant. <laughs> Does he count? He's not animated. He speaks. Yeah, we also have the creepy grave guy who speaks to creepy us. Creepy grave guy. Am I missing anybody? No, just our four animated people. Okay. Or suspects plus Fatima and the people that we talked to in the town. So, so that's six people. So number six, Tino. <laughs> Lowest on the list is Tino. He didn't even do the crime, and we hate him the most. <laughs> <laughs> then I think we have to go with Lori, right? Because yeah. she tried to kill Nancy. Right? Yeah. Slash us, by extension. So we hate her. Literal murderer. Uh, murderess. I think Charlena me... next. Oh, see, I would, pick, I would pick John. Really? Yeah. I would flip-flop those two. Yeah, Either would... one of those two would be next for me. I would say John, and then Charlena... And then I would say the graveyard keeper. Yes. And then obviously number one is Fatima. Yes. <laughs> we are running so long here. Yeah, I know. Now we that got? we've been recording for three hours, <laughs> do we want to get it? I'm not even joking, y'all. Our runtime right now is two hours, 47 minutes, and almost about 48. So, like, this is really, truly how long we spend talking about these games. I cannot describe to you how long Corey and I could actually go talking about Nancy Drew. Like a single Nancy Drew game, we could go forever. But so is there anything else you want to say about Last Train of Blue Moon Canyon? I have one last thing. When, because uh, Bess and George are our phone contacts in this game, and there is a point where you can call them to kind of gossip a little bit about the Hardy Boys, and Bess is kind of initiates this conversation of like, well, who do you like better? I kind of like Joe, and George goes, well, I kind of love Frank. And then, Nancy, you as the player, you get the option to choose. Oh, yeah. I like Frank, well, I like Joe. Actually, I love Ned, remember? And so you can kind of choose that. But I just thought it was so funny that George also says that she loves Frank. Hmm. Hmm. Sorry, George. Back I'm off, ship, George. <laughs> ship Frank with Nancy, not with you, but yeah. Oh, poor George. Yeah, George so always gets the short end of the stick. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Who did you choose? Oh, Frank. Obviously, obviously Frank. Obviously, yeah. <laughs> Every single day of my life, I'm gonna choose Frank Hardy. Ned, who? Who's that guy? Yeah. Whatever. He's not important. Some ex-boyfriend. <laughs> but yes. So. So. Flashlight score. Jeez. Oh my God. It was so <laughs> insane. Okay. I mean, okay. Here's the thing. It's like, if we're going to do like a unit on the PC games, I feel like I have to hold, hold my five, five star. flashlight reviews. At the same time, I'm like, D- does Last Train to Boom and Canyon deserve it? You know what oh, I mean? Yeah. In like, my opinion. It's like, you think about... Just honestly, just qual like, just quality, like good, like really solid puzzles, right? Mm-hmm. You have a good area to explore. You the graphics are good, like the ambiance really is good. The only thing, okay, the only thing that holds me back is the plot holes, right? It's yeah. like kind of the same way that it does with books. Is like it doesn't make entire sense. And while I can excuse like the technology thing, Mm -hmm. because like there is a world in which that could make sense. What I cannot excuse is the lizards. (laughs) I'm sorry. I know it's a bit excessive. The lizards don't make any sense in any reality. So I think for the lizards, I have to give it a four flashlight. I'm going to give it five just yeah. because I love it so much. <laughs> so our, our our average score is four and a half flashlight. So, regular Drews. Do y'all want to know what we're going to do next? We are going to be covering number 17, Legend of the Crystal Skull. Next. Just in time for Mardi Gras. You know, I figured mm-hmm. it was time to do, you know, a, a Louisiana-based game. 
would be would be good. Mm-hmm. But Corey, you brought up earlier today that I didn't even realize is that it's also going to be our anniversary episode. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One year of regular Nancy Drew. That's so crazy to me. It yeah. feels like no time has passed at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and also simultaneously, so much time has passed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Because time works that way now that we live in a pandemic. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's been a good pandemic activity, though. Definitely. Focus on Nancy Drew instead of the world out there. Existential dread. (laughs) Yes. It sure has. It sure has been a great year, I will have to say. And Legend of the Crystal Skull is the first time we ever get to play as Bess. We don't get to (gasps) see Bess just yet, but we do get to play as her for part of the game. So, excellent team best move here yes. Becky's best. wearing her team best shirt Corey made me a team best t-shirt and it's my favorite t-shirt now well thank you so much for joining us regular Drews yeah see you next time for legend of the crystal skull we will see you then thank you for listening to regular Nancy Drew email us at regular Nancy Drew at gmail.com If you like this episode, make sure to rate, review, and subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram at RegularNancyDrew and Twitter at RegularND. You can also support us on Patreon. Patrons at the $3 level vote on upcoming episode topics and all patrons receive early access to each episode as well as weekly bonus content. And to all you regular Drews out there, thanks thanks for for listening. listening.